Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning, perhaps some of you. Uh, let's see. And good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome again to this the talk series, which is uh, one of the established program of KEP, Kaduri Earth Program, that invites world-renowned pra practitioners and dreamers to, to share their wisdoms. Um, we have today, we have almost 400 participants sign up to this talk. Um, they are from Morocco to Denmark to Brazil, all over the globe, really. And uh, my name is Ying. I'm very happy to be hosting today's talk again. And I'm from Guangzhou, mainland China. I'm a friend and collaborator of Kaduri Earth Program. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce um, this talk series, if any of you are new to it. And um, Kaduri Earth Program um, is an initiative co-created by KFBG, Kaduri Farm and Botanic Garden, and its network of collaborators and volunteers by integrating the various strands of KFBG's nature conservation, sustainable living and holistic education program. It provides life transforming learning experience that reconnect people with themselves, each other and the rest of nature and enable them to cultivate resilience in the face of global challenge. Um, and uh, um, we, today we have Dr. Andy Lecter from UK to speak on the topic of animism and the ecological self. I have um, the honor of getting to know Andy at Schumacher College, where he's a senior lecturer. Um, Schumacher College is, uh, in is in Devon, UK, and he works together with Stephen Harding. Um, you, may, you might have already saw the message that Stefan is not well recently. That's why he could not make it tonight. But as Andy has worked closely with Stefan, so I guess you will also um, enjoy this talk on the, this topic on the animism and the ecological self. Um, yes, I, I will invite Andy later to introduce more about yourself. And uh, before I give the mic to uh, Andy. I would like to um, remind you of a few logistics. And first of all, I saw some of you have uh, turned on your camera. That's really good. And if the rest of you, if possible, please turn it on so that we can see you. And secondly, feel free to interact with us at any moment. You can type um, either in Chinese or in, or in English. And thirdly, there is a simultaneous translation, Cantonese, both in Cantonese and Mandarin, providing during this talk. And you can select the language in the toolbar. And if in case of any technical problem, as like you cannot not, uh, hear the translation, etc., feel free to contact uh, KFBG host. Um, and um, the talk will be around 40 minutes. And um, I think, Andy, you can either timekeep yourself or I can be also a timekeeper. And then after the talk, we will have a 35 minute for Q&A before we close this talk. Um, if, I, if nothing else, so we welcome Andy. Please, Andy, thank you for being with us tonight. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone wherever you are in the world, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I want to begin just by um, saying a few words about Stefan, um, who I know dearly wanted to be here, um, but due to ill health can't be. Stefan is one of the founder members of Schumacher College, this great beacon of ecological thought for the last 30 years here in the UK. and um, He's an extraordinary scientist and ecologist. He's a friend, a mentor, a wonderful teacher. And um, uh, I just 
know we all want to send our good wishes to him for a speedy recovery. He's actually in hospital today. Um, but uh, yes, um, hopefully there'll be another chance to um, to catch up with him soon. But he really is a wonderful teacher and has been a great inspiration for me. The second thing I wanted to say right at the beginning is just to acknowledge where I'm speaking from. Um, Obviously, I'm, I'm speaking from a particular age and gender, but I'm meaning more, I'm speaking from a particular intellectual tradition, which is the Western intellectual tradition. It's what I know, it's what I've grown up in. And some of what I'm going to talk about this evening may very well not be news to you, wherever you are in the world. And the West is catching up with some traditional ways of thinking. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I still have a lot of faith in the Western intellectual tradition, even though it's got us into a lot of the problems that we face today. So I'm gonna try and share my screen with you, and then I'm gonna launch into my presentation. It all went so well in the rehearsal, no, I can't. Bear with me. Just one second. Hmm. Okay, that's why. Let's try again. Okay, I'll just hit play. How's that? Can uh, that's working? Great. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is animism and the ecological self. And if these are unfamiliar terms to you, don't worry. Uh, it will all make sense hopefully by the end. I thought uh, it might be worth just introducing myself at the beginning. Um, I began my intellectual life as an ecologist, as a scientist. I did my PhD at Oxford. And um, well, there's much I could say about that. I loved the subjects, but I didn't love Oxford. So I stopped being an ecologist. <laughs> but um, before that, I. I grew up in a in a rural part of Devon, not far from where I'm speaking now, and I had a a childhood that was outdoors. I spent a lot of time in the woods, uh, playing in streams, later sailing dinghies on the river, um, keeping animals, that kind of thing. And my father was and is a very keen ornithologist a bird watcher and although i never studied bird watching myself he would always point out birds of interest and so almost by osmosis i um i took in a, a body of knowledge about the world and i think ultimately that informed why i eventually became an ecologist a scientific ecologist well it's it's a long story which i won't bore you with tonight, but I eventually moved into the humanities, into the study of religion. Now that might seem like quite a large leap, and, and in many ways it was, but I think I've always been, I've always been interested in the big questions, and questions of meaning and purpose and um, metaphysics, these kind of questions. And I realized when I'd made the move into the study of religion that I could start to address these kinds of questions. And in that guise, I have studied what the American scholar of religion, Bron Taylor, calls dark green religion. So paganism, contemporary druidry, neo-shamanism. I'm not going to say much more about those, but I'll happily talk about them in the in the Q&A. These are contemporary revived pagan movements that have a strong focus on the non-human, on nature. 
They are dark green religions. And I suppose you could say that what I'm interested in is ecology and meaning. So I've not really stopped being a scientist, even though I'm in the humanities now, but I'm interested in where um, ecology and meaning meet. How do we find meaning in the world about us and the myriad ways that humans have found to do that through religion, culture, and so on. So I thought I'd just start with a little preamble about ecological ethics. I'm not, this isn't going to be a great long lecture, don't worry. <laughs> but in the West, and this is the, this is the last technical term I'm going to use, I promise. Um, ecological ethics has been founded on what we would call moral extensionism, extending our morals outwards. So here's a diagram to illustrate this. We have humans at the center of our universe. We know we should or we ought to extend moral concern to humans. But what about the rest of the world? What about animals and plants? Um, how far should we extend our moral concern? What, can we think of good reasons why we ought to care for animals or plants or the ecosystem or the climate? So ecological ethics has started with moral concerns of humans and tried to extend those outwards. So animal rights activists will include the animals in our moral reach in our moral purview, um, whereas ecological activists will include ecosystems and so on. I say this because um, I'm going to be talking a lot about deep ecology, and deep ecology has taken a different approach, and I think that's one of the reasons why it makes it a unique um, form of um, moral concern at this time of ecological crisis. I, I mean, I, I haven't begun with by saying <laughs> anything about the ecological crisis. I always take it for granted that we, we know what kind of trouble we're in, uh, in regards to the environment. But my God, we're in a mess. And um, it looks like we're going to shatter the 1.5 degree target of warming set down in the Paris Agreement. Um, and this is dreadful. This is absolutely terrible. And I'm sure where, wherever you are, you are feeling the effects of climate change already. Here in England, we've just had a dreadful, dreadful winter where it hasn't stopped raining. And um, this is only going to get worse here. So here we suffer from floods. Where you are, it might be um, drought and excessive heat. So this is why we need ecological ethics, right? We need to radically change the way we interact with the world. But deep ecology has taken a different approach. It's not just about extending our moral concern to the world, which is quite an intellectual approach, I suppose. Deep ecology has been more concerned about cultivating this idea of the ecological self. Um, this is a photo of me in my younger days, gazing out into the middle distance, <laughs> trying to illustrate an ecological self. The idea is that if we could cultivate in ourselves an ecological sensibility, an ecological self, that would improve our moral character. And then we would, by necessity, create moral acts in the world. We would behave wisely um, to the non-human world. This is the late, great Arnie Ness, who coined the term deep ecology. And he's one of the founders, the founders of the deep ecology movement. Um, Stefan knew him. Stefan was great friends with Arnie and um, would tell you wonderful anecdotes about him. He was a mountaineer, he was a boxer. He used to, um, he was a Norwegian philosopher uh, and had his office, I think, on the second floor of a building. And because he was a mountaineer and a climber, Arnie would often climb up to his office uh, up the outside of the building um, 
I don't think you could get away with that today. Um, an incredible character who had an incredible love of life. And famously, um, when he was a young man, built a cabin up a mountain, the mountain Thurgestein in, in Norway. And um, all part of leading a simple life. And there was no food or water in this cabin. You had to carry everything you needed up there. And this was his retreat. And he would study philosophy and consider um, how we should be with the world from this mountain retreat up a mountain in Norway. Absolutely incredible individual. Anyway, in 1973, Arnie Ness coined the term deep ecology with this very famous paper, the shallow and the deep long range ecology movement, a summary. I don't expect you to read all that, don't worry. But in this paper, Arnie was contrasting what he called shallow ecology with what he called deep ecology. And I suppose the easiest way to understand shallow ecology is what we might think of today as greenwashing. So we have a, an oil company in the UK, British Petroleum BP, and I don't know when it was, maybe 16, 20 years ago, they changed their logo from a shield to a, uh, a, flower, a green flower rosette to try and give people the impression that when they bought their petrol, they were doing so from a lovely green eco-friendly company. Well, you don't need me to tell you that oil companies are, are, are not that. <laughs> that would be what Arnie would call shallow ecology, tinkering at the edges, changing with the edges of the capitalist system, but really not making any profound changes. But what we require, he said, is deep ecology, a fundamental shift in the way we feel about the world, the way we respond to the world. It's almost as if we need to fall in love with the world again. We need to, um, yeah, pay attention to the bird song and notice the turning of the seasons. I'm very struck by the uh, the backdrop to all the Kaduri uh, team, that wonderful sunset. That's a very deep ecological image. It's an image of peace and beauty looking out over this great uh, vista of uh, aliveness. That's what he's talking about. We need, we need a fundamental shift in the way we feel about the world. And when we feel differently about the world, we will act differently. We will perform beautiful moral acts. Again, please don't, please don't try and read this. Um, it's, it's just a screenshot from the paper. But in 1987, Arnie coined the term, the ecological self. And, and, and here he's refining his deep ecological ideas. If we could cultivate an ecological self, then we would perform beautiful acts, not moral acts. We wouldn't need someone to tell us, do not cut down the rainforest. We would know not to cut down the rainforest because we already had cultivated in ourselves an ecological self, a profound love for the world. And, and this was put beautifully by the American writer Theodore Rossack in this book, Eco-Psychology. Here's the quote. He says, if the self is expanded to include the natural world, behavior leading to the destruction of this world will be experienced as self-destruction. If the self is expanded to include the natural world, Behavior leading to destruction of this world will be experienced as self-destruction. So I will know not to cut down the tree outside my house because I will simply know that that tree is um, cleaning the air, providing shade, providing beauty and so on. So we need to cultivate uh, an ecological self. That's the aim and argument of deep ecology. Right, just to return to this diagram. I re you remember I started off with a rather dry um, uh, exposition of 
ecological ethics, extending our moral reach out to the world. Well, with the ecological self, we're extending the boundaries of our self to include the non-human. It's not just our ethics that's expanding, it's our very sense of self. So here's the big question. How do we obtain an ecological self? What, would, what should we do? Well, it must be said that Arne Ness was a little bit vague on this. <laughs> he developed a philosophical method of inquiry um, where you would ask yourself deep philosophical questions to arrive at what he said was an ecosophy, an ecosophy, um, ecological wisdom. But that was only one method. But the method that later writers seem to suggest was very much um, immersion in wilderness. So time spent away from other humans, really in, in what we would call wilderness areas. This is the best image I have of a wilderness. It's not actually a wilderness. It's Samaria Gorge in Crete. Um, civilization is not far away, but it'll do. Very beautiful, beautiful gorge in Crete. And so deep ecology has often privileged access to wilderness and some kind of epiphany, some kind of um, almost religious encounter with the non-human world, with nature. Um, go and, and walk in the mountains and you will experience awe, profound beauty, perhaps even a sense of humility. There's a religious quality to this deep ecological encounter with wilderness. This is how we're going to obtain an ecological self by stepping away from the boundaries of the human world into the non-human world. Well, perhaps you can already see the problem with this as a solution, which is that wilderness really isn't accessible to most of us. Most of us live in urban environments and we, we simply can't afford to go and spend time um, you know, in these remote areas of the world. And it is a fair criticism of the deep ecological movement, but it's underplayed matters of social justice. I don't think it's entirely true that it ignored matters of social justice, but I think it's not its main focus. The main focus of deep ecology is how we connect with the world. Um, and it's, it's um, fallen to later commentators um, to, to bring in the social justice element. I think it, it, it has to be said, though, that deep ecology has been one of the most um, influential movements within ecological thought, famously um, inspiring um, the Earth First movement in um, America and also in Europe, um, inspiring people to take nonviolent direct action um, and, and this image prevent the um, felling of old growth forest in um, in America. So again, quote, quoting Bron Taylor, Bron Taylor will say that deep ecology has been the most influential branch of ecological thought of the last 30, 40 years. So hopefully now you've got an idea of what deep ecology is and what an ecological self might look like, even if you're still wondering how you might obtain an ecological self. So deep ecology, it's come very much from ethics, from Western philosophy, and it's, it's trying to rethink our relationship with the non-human world by cultivating an ecological self. Animism, which I'm now going to move on to, has a different origin story. It's not come from philosophy, it's come from anthropology. It's come from the Western encounter with uh, other people, the study of other people. And I want to distinguish um, two interpretations of animism. There is the old animism and there is the new animism. 
And the old animism is a theory of religion put forward by this guy, Edward Burnett Tyler. Please forgive the comedy glasses. Um, I just found it online when I was looking for an image of Edward Burnett Tyler. I liked the just juxtaposition. Um, Edward Burnett Tyler was is considered one of the founders of the discipline of anthropology. He was at Oxford. He never traveled to study other people. He relied on data coming in from what was then the British Empire. And um, he came up with a theory to try and explain religion. Like all good 19th century intellectuals, he was an atheist and he wanted to understand religion. And he thought the origins of all religion lay in animism. And for Tyler, animism, he didn't coin the term, but animism is a category error. By that I mean, I'll think of a category as a, as a bucket or a bowl into which we put things, we put concepts. So I might have a container marked things that are alive. And being a good Western scientist, I would put animals in that container and I would put plants and I would put fungi. I'm not sure about viruses. I'm not quite sure where they sit. They're a borderline case. But in the, in the container marked things that are not alive, I would probably put rocks and mountains and the seasons and so on. Now, for Tyler, he talked about primitive people. That's a, a term we wouldn't use today. But he thought that primitive people, i.e. indigenous people, routinely made category errors where they um, they wrongly attributed aliveness to things that, to Tyler, were obviously not alive. Uh, in particular, they attributed the possession of a soul. So if the soul is the thing that moves or animates things, then primitive people, his language, primitive people, routinely misattribute souls to inanimate things. I hope that makes sense. I hope that translates. Sorry, there's a lot of words there. And we find this, he said, in primitive cultures. And this, he said, is the origin of religion. And he came up with a whole theory about where religion came from, how it evolved from animism. I'm not going to go into that now. That's, that's too, um, too much of a rabbit hole. If you Google animism, most of the definitions that you find online are still this, this old animism, the idea that animism says that the world is full of souls and souls animate the world. And it's important to realize that this is an idea cooked up by an English intellectual in the 19th century. But there is a new animism, and this has been emerging through um, the work of various anthropologists Nurit Bird David, Graham Harvey, well, my, he, Graham Harvey was my teacher in the study of religion. He's a scholar of religion and others. And they've been revisiting this old word in the light of new studies of indigenous peoples. And now we have a new definition of animism, which is the view that sees the world as full of people or persons, only some of whom are human, but all of whom are worthy of respect. Now, this is a subtle idea, but a very powerful idea. Now, the overarching category into which we can put things in the world is that of personhood. And a small subset of that is humans. So there are other than human people in the world. As I look out my window, I can see other than human bird persons. I can see other than human tree persons. I can see other than human buttercups, this beautiful yellow flower growing in the meadow outside my window. So in the new animism, it's not about souls. It's got nothing to say about souls. It's simply that in animistic cultures, the world is full of people. And because the world is full of people, we need respectful relationships with those people. We need to find the correct etiquette to be with those people. 
So say I need to cut a tree down because I need the timber to make a house. What's the respectful way I can do this? How do I pay respects to this other than human tree person who has every right to exist and, and be there? So with a worldview of animism where personhood is the category, is the important category, the emphasis is on relationship. How do I maintain the right relationships with the non-human people, the other than human people, with whom I dwell, with whom I share the world? Now, as you would imagine, animism is to be found very clearly and very obviously in traditional cultures, such as the which I'll, um, I've shown here. But it's also found in modern cultures. It's really never very far away. This is a, an image from Schumacher College um, uh, where we have been reviving an old English custom called crying the neck, which is that when you take a harvest, you take the last sheath of corn, or in this case, flax, and as you harvest it, everybody um, cries out, the neck, the neck, the neck. And you keep that in a special place until the next year when you're sowing the crop and you return that sheaf of corn or flax to the land. I would argue this is an animistic ritual, an animistic custom. So. What is animism? Let's go into it in a bit more detail. What do you have to do to be an animist? Well, first of all, uh, another stupid word, auscultation. It just means deep listening. We need to de listen deeply to the world. I, I'm, a, I'm a musician, I'm a folk musician, so I would say this, but I'm all about listening. I think listening is a beautiful, beautiful metaphor for how we need to be with the world. Forget the, the apparatus I'm using here. That's just for, to make an arresting visual image. This is me recording birdsong. Um, when we listen to the world, we are, we are in a state of receptivity, but we can do so actively. I think we're all very used to the idea of looking at things. We're very certainly Western cultures or modern cultures, we're very visual. We look at things all the time. And to look at the world um, is already to affect the world. So I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes if a bird is flying over and you look at it, the moment you make eye contact with the bird, it changes direction because it perceives your look as a threat. You can try this if you've never noticed it. Just try looking hard at a bird, and I'm sure, I, I promise you, more often than not, the bird will move. Looking is often a sign of threat in the, in the animal world, but listening, not so. And so if you're listening, you're giving your attention to the world, but in a way that is not so threatening to the world. So in animism, we listen to the world, we give our attention. What a gift, what a gift in this world where we are bombarded with social media and smartphones to put all that down and give our attention to the world. Beautiful gift. But secondly, animism consists in reciprocity. I'm doing a, a figure of eight, a lemniscate shape here. We give back to the world. So by listening to the world, we learn to know it and know the species of birds that live about me because I've given them my attention. I've learned them, I can recognize them. And now I can give something back in reciprocity. Now, this is often the giving of gifts. I was just teaching about animism in the college at Schumacher College last week, and someone was there from Indonesia. And she said, well, this is not news. All my family do this. This is very normal. Uh, she was saying in Indonesia, often there are guardian trees that are said to guard people's houses. And periodically, maybe once a month, 
people will go and give gifts to the trees, coffee, tobacco, sweets, a bowl of rice. So this is very much alive in many parts of the culture, many parts of the world. You remember I started this talk by saying, I come from a particular location where we're trying to refine this. This is probably old news to you, but we give gifts, we give something back. We give chocolate or tobacco or a handful of oats or a handful of rice, or we give our time, we give our energy. We perform rituals, we dance, we dance all night. We dress up as birds and dance all night and give, give our time and our energy back to the world. We do it through ritual. Um, I'm thinking of a, a ceremony performed by um, traditional uh, indigenous farmers in Peru, in which at the planting season, clay pots are broken and given to the soil in gratitude for the crop, for the harvest that will come. And you can still find, archeologists have found the remains of broken pots from the Inca civilization, from before the time of the conquest. People have been doing this, this reciprocal relationship with the land for generations. So yes, it can be a physical gift or it can be a ritual gift. It can be a kind of performance. So it's all about maintaining the correct etiquette. This is a beautiful ethnography of the Koyakon people who I found in um, what we would call Alaska, but their home nation is in the northwest of North America, the frozen north. So these are hunt hunting people. Uh, this book is quite old. It was published in the 1980s based on research done in the 1970s, and I don't know how accurate it is today, but it's a beautiful description of an animistic world. So the Koyukon people, they make their living by hunting and, and trapping animals. And when they trap an animal, they have to perform um, certain rituals, certain acts of respect, lest they lose their hunting luck. So let's say you trap a beaver, you have to butcher the animal in a certain way, um, perhaps in silence or um, done in a certain order. You have to say certain prayers, you have to sing certain songs, you have to dispose of the parts you're not going to use in a certain way, all to maintain this cycle of respectful relationships. So there will be more beaver down the line. So the question for an animist world, worldview is how do we maintain right relationships with the non-human others with whom we dwell and and as i've suggested i think animism is to be found in many many parts of the world in my culture in british culture it's really not far away in time um, and many of our traditional customs our folk customs um, can easily be read as animist in in nature So to try and bring this all together, I've talked about two domains in Western thought, the ecological self, which has come from philosophy, from environmental ethics, from ecological ethics, as an idea of how we could change our idea of ourselves to extend the boundaries outwards so that we embrace the world into ourselves we form an ecological self and that cultivates in us a moral character such that we perform beautiful acts in the world and this idea has been very influential particularly on ecological movements of the last 30 years but what happens when we take that idea and we add to it ideas of animism Animism with its notion that the world is full of people or persons and that we need to cultivate respectful relations with the non-human others with whom we live and share and, and dwell. What happens when we bring those two together? Well, I would argue that we 
come up with a relational self. The, one of the problems of deep ecology, it had a, a, a Euro-American origin um, amongst educated classes who are very used to being able to go to wilderness areas. But what about the rest of us who live in urban environments, who live in cities? Well, even in the center of the city, the city is teeming with non-human life. There are plants that burst up through the pavement. There are birds and reptiles and mammals that make their home in the city. I was in the, in staying in the center of Bristol, which is a city in the southwest of England, right in the heart of Bristol, staying in a grotty hotel. And um, I opened my window and there was a goldfinch singing its heart out from a tree at just outside the hotel. So animism is something I think that can be done anywhere. It doesn't require wilderness. We can pay attention to those plants that are bursting up through the pavement. We can find their names. We can find out who they are, what they like doing, how they live. They may even have something for us. They may make a very good healing tea. They may be poisonous. They may have nothing for us. But we can give them our attention and we can notice them and we can start to cultivate an ecological or relational or animistic self right in the heart of the city. And of course, to address the world's problems, we need change on a large scale. But in the meantime, we as individuals can act. We can become better ecological citizens by giving our attention to the world, learning about it, um, learning about these other than human people, and, and starting to build respectful relationships. You know, it may be that the respectful thing to do when a weed is growing up through the cracks in the pavement is just to let it grow rather than immediately pulling it up or uh, dousing it in the uh, weed killer. So um, I think that's about 40 minutes and that's the end of my presentation and I'd be delighted to um, take your questions. And thank you very much for listening. Wow, thank you so much, Andy. I was, uh, I couldn't stop myself uh, from smiling. I can feel it in my body as you, as seeing your some of your photos and and uh, yeah, listening to some of your experience. Um, and I was quite surprised that you can put like so many new thoughts and ideas in just 40 minutes. Uh, and I, I Hopefully can... not too many. <laughs> Hopefully no, it wasn't no, overwhelming. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I can really see the intersection, as you said, of uh, ecology and meaning that you beautifully embody. And I feel like um, you have thrown many stones, not many, but at least a dozen of stones in a lake. And I would like to ask the audience, like, how do you receive them? And how do you resonate with them? Any particular stone you want to pick up and co continue um, pursuing or inquiring? So now we have um, 43 minutes, around around 43 minutes for Q&A. And, &A. and um, um, yeah, so if you have any questions, you're welcome to type in the chat box in either English or Chinese in our translator will help us to uh, translate. And um, yeah, you can ask questions or share your thoughts uh, or comments. And uh, yeah, I, um, there's one comment as you share about um, the Indo Indonesian um, participant who share with you, oh, we have been doing this all the time. And one participant wrote on the chat box that, she or she noticed uh, the little offerings at almost every houses while in uh, Bali is in um, Indonesia. Yeah, so, and um, wow, a lot of uh, questions and comments uh, coming up. And um, one participant, she said she really enjoyed your sharing and she felt the connection with uh, spirituality and also with, with nature. 
and um, somehow I would like to ask a question myself before <laughs> drumming to all these uh, um, comments and because I feel it's very important. As you talk about um, ecological selves, you said that Ananes didn't quite tell how we can acquire this uh, ecological self. Because I feel like actually we all know as human beings, we all know um, we live in, 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 in the earth and it's part, of, it's part of our home. And we know that we need to expand ourselves to include the natural world. But as you said, what if we if this awareness just stay as ethic? We know that it's right to do, but actually it's, we don't feel it in our beings. What if we don't experience it? What, what if it's to just remain as an ethic? So I would like to ask, the question I would like to ask is that, um, could you share some of your practice, either you or Stefan or other teachers at Schumacher College, how, how do we help us to develop this ecological self? Yeah, I would like to start. That's a great question. Um, so I'd like to share two things. <clears throat> the first is something we teach at Schumacher College, but it's not unique to Schumacher College. And it comes very much from um, uh, people teaching deep um, nature connection. And this is the idea of the sit spot, of finding somewhere where you can go and sit away from the human and just observe what is happening around you. So you choose somewhere that is um, that you can visit regularly, where you feel safe. And I um, acknowledge that there are privileges there about who feels safe and where. So you have to choose somewhere where you feel safe. And that you can go regularly and you just sit quietly and observe. That's all you have to do. That's the invitation. And the idea is that by going back and returning to this place, you start to build up a relationship with that place. You notice its moods, its changing qualities at different times of the day. And maybe if it's safe for you to do so at night. You can observe its changing qualities as the year turns. What are the what are the seasonal changes where you live? Is it that you have a wet season and a dry season, or do you have the four seasons famously in in northern Europe? What is it? And then you can start to observe who 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 lives there. What are the plants and animals and insects that make their home there? Maybe you can find a name for them. Um, and in that sense, you're building a profound relationship with place. So that's one technique that anyone can use. And you might object and say, well, I live in the city. I can't, I can't do this. Well, I had one student who uh, lived in the Netherlands. I think he lived in Rotterdam. And he worked in the city. He worked in the financial uh, city and while all his colleagues would go out and have a cigarette he would go and sit just across the road to where there was a, a tree and a small patch of grass and he would sit there so it, it can be done in the city though obviously it's harder because it's harder to um, see the non-human but of course it's there so that's one thing the second suggestion um, and this perhaps reflects my own biases and interests, but I would encourage people to pay attention to the sounds that birds make. Birds are a good, a good group to choose because there are birds everywhere. Um, mammals, it's harder to find. Insects, it depends on where you are in the world, but um, they can be hard to identify. But birds are everywhere. You know, the chances are you look out the window, you will see a bird. And birds make a number of different sounds. Some of them sing. Um, some of them have these beautiful songs. 
some of them make contact calls so they squawk and they chirp and they tweet to one another some of them make alarm calls but you can you can pay attention to the bird song the bird sounds and what i try and do is every year i try and learn one more bird song so here where where i'm speaking from in in britain we're at a very high latitude and we have this extraordinary phenomenon called the dawn chorus where from about well now at this time of year from about half past four in the morning all the songbirds start singing a lot of people hate it because it keeps them awake um <laughs> This beautiful phenomena that only happens in the spring and the early summer. And you can learn to pay attention and go, ah, that's a blackbird, that's a wren. Ah, there's a greenfinch over there. And then suddenly your whole appreciation of the world changes. And I've been doing this for so many years now that I don't consciously pay attention, but I'm, I'll be walking along in spring and I'll suddenly go, there's a chiff chaff. The chiff chaff is a small, brown, insignificant bird that flies all the way from Africa to come here to breed and has this, it's not even a beautiful song. It just goes chiff chaff, chiff chiff chaff, chiff chiff chaff, chiff chaff, chiff chiff, for hours, for hours and hours. But I'm not paying attention to it, but suddenly, some part of me goes, ah, chiff chaff. And I know that the spring is coming. So I'm feeling the arrival of the spring on some bodily level. Likewise, we have a, a very famous bird called the European robin, small bird with a bright red breast. You may have seen it on Christmas cards. It, unusually for all birds, it, it sings throughout the winter, but it changes its song. It has two songs. It has a summer song and a winter song. And at the moment, it's doing its summer song and it will stop soon. And then as the autumn starts to come, it will switch to its autumn song. And last year, I, for the first time ever, I suddenly went, there's a Robin's autumn song. I wasn't paying attention to it, but some deep part of me tuned into it. And so... I think this is what you were getting at with your question is, is this almost embodied way of knowing the world because we've paid attention to it and maybe I've learned with my head. Now I'm feeling it in my heart and feeling the arrival of the chiff chaff or the change from aut summer to autumn with the change of the Robin's song. And, and I promise you that wherever you are in the world, traditional knowledge will, will have a body of knowledge of exactly this kind that birds behaving like this means that the weather's going to change or birds behaving like that means that there's a snake in the tree or whatever it is. So th there are two ways that I think are available to everyone, wherever you are in the world. One, find a sit spot that you can go to on a regular basis and just pay attention. The other is start to pay attention to the birds and you can learn so much about what's happening in the world. Um, by paying attention to the birds. Thank you so much, Andy. You remind me of um, some of my, I would call morning glories. If I woke up at four or five, that's the best gift I will ever get. Wow, there's a, actually, there are lots of comments and um, questions. I found myself like, one year listening to your sharing and the other year I have to kind of <laughs> summarize what are those questions and how could I ask you? Uh, but I, I found it a lot of um, 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 questions or, or um, how to say, some um, inquiries on the animism. Um, like one person said that How, why can why we kind of use new and old? How can we transcend this binary? And the other one said, um, like the uh, re, uh, the ecological self and animism, how are they related to the world religion, which are like the Buddhism, Christianity, all this we know as like religion. 
And one asks why we say personhood in, in animism, because of course, person is still referred to human being. What if we said any, animalhood or otherhood to really kind of um, de delink ourselves with this human being, this identity of a human being? And one asks, what's the history and the origins of animism? I don't think we have the time to really, <laughs> I think it's like a 10 hour um, lecture. Yeah, so maybe you can share more of um, the animism. Um, so that, that last question about the word personhood um, is, yes, I've, I've been asked that many times, and it's a question that comes up um, in animism. What I didn't talk about was where the new animism comes from, and it comes from um, the work of an American anthropologist called Irving Hallowell, who studied the Ojibwe people who um, Ojibwe nation around the Great Lakes area in North America. And he was studying them in the 1950s. And it's from the Ojibwe that Hallingwell, Hall Hallowell took this term other than human persons. So I can't remember, it's a long, long time since I've read Hallowell's paper. So I can't remember if it's his, his transliteration of an Ojibwe concept or if it's um, a direct translation. I understand the point you're making. And in, in other lectures I give on animism, I give a whole list of alternative alternatives that we could use that don't involve the word person. They're all problematic. Um, what animism is asking us to do is to rethink the concept of personhood. So yes, you're right that that word comes laden with connotations of the human and seems to be putting the human at the center. But actually, it's inverting that. It's saying that personhood is the universal category of which only a small subset are humans. So it's asking us to invert our thinking. Now, the extent to whether it's successful in doing that is whether people are persuaded by it or whether they still think that it comes with a anthropocentric bias and i can only you know if you're unhappy with that term i quite understand that um but i've yet to find a better term i sometimes use the word denizens which is a little you know it's a bit archaic um those who dwell in a place but uh it's hard to it's hard to come up with a a, a word or a category that doesn't bring its own problems um, I don't. I don't actually see a problem between distinguishing the old and the new animism. The old animism is is deeply problematic. It's it's built on basically a racist view of the world, um, and I I'm very happy to distinguish the new new animism from the old animism in that way, um, while still maintaining that the word animism is a useful category at this stage. And then the third question was about animism and, and the world religions. This is a dreadful confession to make as a scholar of religion, but I'm, I'm, I'm really quite ignorant about the world religions. They were never my interest. Um, and, and those that I do know most about are, are um, the religions of the book, Islam, Judaism and Christianity. Um, there's been much, much written on religions and ecology and much debate. Um, it is undeniably the case that the focus of the religions of the book, the Abrahamic religions, was not really on ecology, though some theologians have attempted to um, find ecological readings of, say, the Bible, Christian Bible or whatever. To greater or lesser extent, it's all very debated. Um, equally, um, there was a lot of hope that Eastern religions um, were by necessity more ecological. And again, there's been a massive debate about that within the literature. Um, it's a while since I've looked at it. I, I would say that um, animism is often the new, what I'm calling new animism, as in 
reciprocal relationships with the world are found within religions all around the world. Um, and it's hard to draw any firm conclusions. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking of Shinto in Japan, where, um, and, and Tibetan Buddhism, which clearly has origins in uh, shamanistic religions. Um, you know, there are there are animistic currents to be found in many of many of the religions in the world. Was there a fourth question? Have I answered all the questions? The fourth question is not answerable because it's history and origin. Oh, it's the history. <laughs> well, it is answerable, but probably not in this Q and A. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, but I think related to that is that um, some audience asked for like some um, like book recommendations or reference so that I think people who are interested in ecological self and also um, animism, they can kind of do some research in their own time. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the great deep ecologists is David Abram and his book, The Spell of the Sensuous. Um, is rightly a classic, it's very readable. Um, he he was friends with Arnie Ness. And although he, he comes from a slightly different philosophical origin point, phenomenology, which I'm not gonna go into, um, his is a very readable book, both his books actually, Becoming Animal. If you want to get into animism, most of the work that's been written on animism or the new animism is quite academic, but if you don't, mind reading academic books. I would recommend Graham Harvey's book, Animism. Um, I forget the subtitle. Yes, anyway, it's just called Animism by Graham Harvey. And then Deep Ecology, well, Stefan's book, um, Anima Earth, um, is, a, is a wonderful introduction to all this way of thinking. And then if you if you really want to dive into ecological ethics, there's a book called Ecological Ethics by Patrick Curry. It's now in its second edition, and that's a very readable introduction to um, yeah, all of all of these schools of thought. I don't know whether it goes into animism. Um, mm. Yeah, and I think um in the later on in the email with the recording, we can share this information with the participants. Yes, there, I think there are a lot of um, yeah, literatures that people can read. And there's um, um, one question uh, from Liang Liang. She asked if you could speak more about um, the connect connectedness or the distinction between what has come to be known as spiritual ecology and deep ecology. Mm. Well, um, I wouldn't claim to be an expert on spiritual ecology. It's um, it's a it's a movement that I think is is trying to bring ecology and meaning absolutely to the forefront. It's saying that um, so. Well, maybe we should start by looking at this word ecology. In its strict sense, ecology. Um, is a science. It's if if you do a keyword search, a Google keyword search on the word ecology, um, it will say ecology is a branch of biology that looks at the interaction of organisms with each other and with their environment. And that's certainly what I studied when I was an ecologist at Oxford. Mm. There's another connotation of the word ecology, which is something to do with political and economic and social change to do with our relationship with the environment. So we talk about things being eco-friendly. We talk about eco-side, eco-feminism, eco-crisis, and so on. That phrase eco is encouraging us to adopt a more moral stance towards the world. But there's a third meaning of ecology, which is that it seems to imply to people that the world is interconnected, radically so, radically interconnected, and that interconnection is a source of meaning for us. So, well, I, 
I'm a scholar of religion and I, I struggle with the word spirituality, but I don't want to go down that mm. rabbit hole. I, I prefer the word meaning because it, to me, it's, it's less, has fewer unhelpful connotations. But the spiritual ecology movement is saying there is meaning for us in the world if only we pay attention to it. And part of that meaning is that once we've appreciated our spiritual place in the world, we are impelled to act, to, to become servants of the ecological, ecological crisis and, and put ourselves at the service of the world. So I think there's a, there's a real overlap with deep ecology because deep ecology was saying, you know, if you can have some kind of moment of expanded self, some epiphany, some nature mystical experience where you encounter the world, then that also impels you to act on those principles. So I think they overlap, but, um, in, you know, the spiritual ecology movement includes, for example, engaged Buddhism or um, engaged Islam and so on. Um, so it's, it's more closely tied to religions, whereas I think deep ecology you could read as a religious movement, but it's not so overtly religious. But um, I don't want to get stuck down a rabbit hole of what we mean by spirituality and religion. Unless people are interested, I'll happily talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. I think, um, yeah, by elaborating your understanding of um, these two concepts, I think we all have our own, we develop our own understandings. Yeah. It's, um, I think there's another very interesting question by Dr. Doris. Do we need to animalize beings in this world in order to connect with them? I think it's very interesting because I think we like we use metaphors as if like the external world is actually part of us. But her question is that do we really have to do that? Or there's another way, another way of making connection with the world. There's two two ways of answering this, two schools of thought. I have animist friends who would say that the, we have evolved to be social beings and that actually it's, it's just in our nature to personify the world. And this is a good thing. So I swear at my computer when it's not working. I did this morning when I couldn't get it to do something. I was swearing at my computer as if, as if it's a person. And that enables me to, to be in the world. And, and this is okay. There's no problem with this. Another school of thought is that the danger with that is that we are projecting humanness onto the world. And I think what animism invites us to do is receive the world as it is. So I don't know if, if this is a familiar image to you, but Quite often my children have drawn trees and put a smiley face in the tree. In fact, in the, um, uh, I was going to talk about Disney movie. I'm not going to talk about Disney movie, but Disney, it happens in Disney movies. They sometimes put faces in trees. And, and that's not what I'm talking about because that's a, a anthropomorphism. We are trying to turn a tree into a human face. I think what animism is inviting us to do is regard the tree as it really is. It's a tree. It's, it's a tree person. From the tree's perspective, I am an other than tree person. From a rock's perspective, I am an other than rock person. Um, so it's not that I'm trying to turn a tree into a, into a person. I'm trying to relate to it as a tree. A tree is there doing what trees do. It's eating sunlight and building communities of relationship with the mycorrhizal network and um, having birds take its seeds around the world. That's what a tree does. Um, it's, not, it's not something with a smiley face. So there's, there's two answers there, and I can see, I can see both, both perspectives. I think it is a problem if we anthropomorphize, but sometimes 
of that act of imaginative act does bring the world to life? It's a great question. Mm, thank you. I think next time when I see all those smiley faces, I would imagine a, a, a different story rather than, yeah. Um, wow. Um, this, someone brings up a, a term called techno-animism. I don't know whether you've come across this term, I haven't. So I, and um, this person asked if you have come across this theory, techno animism. How 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 do you see this theory? Um, it it may have a specific meaning, in which case I I've not studied it and I've not come across it, but I would imagine it has something to do with, um. Our relationship with technology and in particular machine learning and and artificial intelligence um so i i, I can't answer that head on um but but there is something to be said about our relationship with technology here um because that necessarily affects how we see the world um Humans have always, it seems, or certainly in recent years, used our own creations as metaphors for engaging with the world. So, um, you know, we talk about the book of nature, the book of nature that can be read. Well, the, the book is a piece of technology and um, the steam engine was a, a very fruitful metaphor for many years and has guided physics as a metaphor um, but now of course we have computers and neural networks and our tendency is to regard the world as being in some sense like our creations and I my my only comment would be that we need to remember that these are just metaphors based on things that we've made and that the world doesn't necessarily behave like that but as for techno animism, I, I'm sorry, I, I've not, I've not fully read about the term. If you've got any recommendations, uh, I would, I would very much like to dive into that. Thank you, Andy. Um, there's there's some one um, student who is studying uh, environmental science. He would like to ask. How can I relay my course in relation to studying about animism? Um, and the ecological self. Animism and ecological self are still not prevalent in the academia world. And you being, having been in academia and now, I think still academia, but you um, research and talk about animism and ec ecological service is very different than the traditional in traditional academia. So I think you would um, have some very good suggestion for those who are in academia but would like to extend their uh, world in like, for example, animism and ecological self. Any um, um, suggestion for them? Mm. Well, um, Western intellectual thought and academia are, are all built on what I would call instrumentalism. The idea that humans have ends and the world is a means to those ends. And one of our ends is finding out about the world. And that's what we do as scientists. And we do our experiments on the world and um, the world in that sense is a means to our ends. So we might build a the Large Hadron Collider uh, at great expense and God knows what environmental cost, but that justifies our desire to find out how the world works. And, and that view is famously sort of antithetical to what we're talking about here. And so one of the reasons why um, well, my, my own research in, in ecology was very mathematical. 
I, I, I wrote models basically on the computer and analyzed large data sets because I didn't want to be doing experiments on animals, however much, however valuable um, that data might be. I didn't want to be the one removing a population of birds to see what happens. So on, in one sense, um, science is antithetical to what we're talking about here. But in another, you actually talk to scientists and it's very easy to sort of lambast science as, as a monolithic entity, but you talk to actual scientists and they often have profound knowledge and care and concern for the world. I mean, Stefan is a great example, but he's not, he's not alone. Um, that the people absolutely care passionately. And in fact, in that original deep ecology paper, Arnie Ness suggests that we should all model ourselves on field ecologists. That's the kind of knowledge about the world we should have. So I, I understand where the question's coming from, that if you're reading environmental science, people probably aren't going to be talking about giving offerings <laughs> back to the world and you might be laughed at but there may be a way in which you can do this um this is a slightly tangential anecdote but there was a, a very famous british tv show called time team which is an archaeology program uh, which i used to watch avidly and um every week they'd go and dig something up and, and they would get in living history experts who could help them make a flint arrowhead or build a dugout canoe or cast a bronze sword. And once one of the, um, one of the people they got on, this, this person who worked with bronze said, look, every week you dig something up, it's time you gave something back. And so he got them to make a bronze sword, which they then, deposited in a lake as a thank you to the ancestors for all the objects that they dug up. And clearly the archeologists were a little bit embarrassed, but they did it. And so I think things are, are changing. And so, you know, if you can find the scientists who care and talk to them and have conversations and say, look, we're having this effect by doing our research, we are having this effect on the world. What can we put back? How can we reciprocate? You you may find that you're on very fertile ground there and that you won't, these days, you won't meet so much resistance. Thank you, Andy. I think another question that is really related to uh, what you've shared is that um, someone uh, type in the chat box saying that she because she she feel like some of her idea and feelings can be now explained. It seems you've offered her new narrative for new way of explaining her how 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 she feels and how she thinks, and she oh, raised wonderful. a very important very important question of um how we can communicate to the world with our so special or maybe different than the, than the um, um, traditional or the mainstream narrative, how we can communicate like this really what we feel and how we think to the world. We'd like to listen to your thought and your experience. Yeah, that's a great question. I think, sharing our passion and our love for the world. I think that goes a long way. I don't think people are necessarily persuaded by intellectual argument. I think they're persuaded by passion. And if you can share your passion for the world, your love of the world, it's infectious. Love and passion are infectious. Um, but yeah. that's one way. Another way is by create, creative acts of play. So I'm thinking about during lockdown. Um, you remember I were talking about 
plants growing up through the pavement, a group of activists in London started going out during lockdown and, and drawing with chalk a ring around any plant that they saw coming up through the pavement. And they would write the name of the plant, both its Latin name and its common names. It's actually illegal to do that. It's illegal to deface the highway in England. So they were breaking the law in doing this, even in chalk. But suddenly, something that nobody notices, nobody sees, you, your attention is drawn to it. And it, it's no longer a weed. It has a name. It has a name. It's a being. It's a thing of beauty, something we can pay attention to. It was a beautiful, beautiful piece of direct action, but very playful and very creative. And so I think acts like this, art helps, music helps, um, but ultimately sharing our passion and our love for the world, because that's what it comes down to. Nobody, nobody likes being harangued. Nobody likes being shouted at or preached at. But if you can, be, if you can draw people with you, for your love and your passion of the world. I mean, I, I I didn't start talking about blackbird song. We have a blackbird, a type of bird called a blackbird, European blackbird, has the most beautiful song that is is improvised, improvised phrases, all on a form. And it's, I tell you, it's better than jazz, really. And if if I, if if you can just share that with one other person. <laughs> And they they then go and listen to it and hear what you're hearing, then I mean our work is done, right? I thought I've ended in this very beautiful um, image of passion and love, but suddenly someone raised a also very important question, and then I would like to uh, end with is that M N she share like nowadays we oh, oh our human behavior. Uh, shaped by whether it is convenience or whether it's easy for human beings. So the question is that this ecological self, this concept, whether we can fundamentally change people's behavior. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, you, you, you cut out there for just a moment. Could you just repeat the question? Ah, ah sorry, sorry. Yeah. So the concept of ecological self, given that we tend to um, choose things that are more convenient, whether the concept of ecological self can fundamentally change our behavior. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, there is empirical evidence that people who feel a greater sense of connection or relatedness to the non-human world engage in more pro-environmental behaviors. So um, the way they do this is they measure people's sense of nature relatedness, how connected to the world they feel, and there's a number of measures for doing this. And then they ask, you know, what kind of ecological behaviors they engage in, and there is a relationship. Um, I agree that we face a huge battle to turn this thing around. Um, and, and at times one can feel despair and feel that there's nothing to be done. Um, but I, and there are, there are many levels at which I think we should be acting, both at high structural levels, political, economic, cultural, but also on the individual level. And I suppose today I'm talking about the individual level as what about what we can do. Um, I'm just always minded of Greta Thunberg, um, who, you know, who knew that a 15 year old girl ducking out of school on a Friday and protesting could become a global movement? No one knew that. Who knows what the consequences will be if you share your love of the world with one other person or two other people you simply don't know so you're right to 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 throw in a a line of caution and pragmatism and i hear you um 
we need to act in whatever way we can and on every level. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And um, we are approaching towards the end of um, our time together today. And uh, thank you so much for sowing, at the end, sowing the seed of playfulness, sowing the seed of passion <laughs> and love. And I think this is, yeah, this is um, the greatest gift we could have and we could share with the world as a human being and um um so some um closings from me and then i will um hand over to you andy for a, a closing word but i would like to share with the audience that um we have confirmed two amazing speakers for the next talk under the theme theme, Gaia and Ecology. Um, and the details will be announced soon on our webpage. Yeah, please um, keep in touch. And, um, and if people would like to learn more about the philosophy of Gaia and deep ecology, welcome to explore with Stefan Harding in our upcoming online course starting starting in june um, the name of this course is deepen deepening our connection to nature a journey into gaia and deep ecology and um yeah the the registration deadline is approaching so if you are interested or if you are inspired from today's talk please um, go to our website and you can see more details of this course. And uh, also, um, there's, a, there's a QR code of the survey link. Um, um, maybe next slide, please. There's a QR code of the survey link. And um, please uh, share your feedback with us. We would like to uh, hear from you. And the story, uh, those uh, who raise amazing questions and comments, there's not enough time for me to share uh, with Andy. But thank you all for your, gosh, it's, it's so active. My mind is um, blowing with all your um, amazing ideas and would like to, well, really have time to dig into those, even though we might end up in the rabbit hole, as uh, Andy <laughs> mentioned a couple of times. Yes, and um, yeah, Andy, any final words before we have two more minutes? Well, um, I just want to thank you all um, for your attentive listening. Um, I've had just half an eye on the, on the chat and watching questions come thick and fast. So thank you very much for your questions and thank you for your attention. And um, thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are in the world. And um, if you ever find your way to Schumacher College, then maybe we'll get a chance to sit around a fire and chew on these questions at, at great length because they're the, the most important questions of our time. How should we be with the world? There is no more important question. <laughs>